Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. You know the irony of that question, right? If you can't hear the question, you're not going to give me an answer, and I'll never know that there's a problem. Oddly, that's a good metaphor for the state of diversity in STEM, as we are right now. Um, so I also want to uh, thank you for being here, thank you for inviting me, and also thank you for introducing me by my title. Um, there's an interesting phenomenon that when people are introducing female speakers in academic settings, they often forget the title and sometimes the last name and just refer to the female speaker by their first name, whereas when introducing male speakers, everybody seems to remember the title and the last name and whatnot. Uh, it's just one of the many ways in which uh, women are disadvantaged in academia in ways that we don't think about, in ways that aren't conscious. People don't consciously introduce people differently. It's just something that we do. Okay, so the title is Why STEM Still Lacks Diversity. Um, laser pointer, there we go. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. I'm mostly going to be saying physics, um, or talking about physics, partially because I am a physicist, partially because physics has its own special set of weirdness. Um, but whenever I see physics, you can replace that with engineering, computer science, math, or even philosophy, and most of what I say will still hold true. Uh, some other sciences, biology, uh, and to a degree chemistry have fewer issues. And that's one reason that I focus on physics, um, but I'll kind of discuss those later in the talk. Okay, so some key points, uh, otherwise known as too long fell asleep. I know what happens in seminars, I've sat in them too. Uh, so most of our efforts so far have been focused on recruiting. We want to recruit more people into science, into engineering, into physics. Um, and generally, when I, or when I started giving this talk, that's what I mainly focused on, was the recruiting efforts. Um, also because I do a lot of outreach, so I do a lot of recruiting. Um, and one of the ideas that I talk about is that many individuals have unmet needs, and I put that in quotes because I'm going to uh, define it later, uh, but it acts as barriers in people becoming physicists. These barriers create leaks in the pipeline at all levels, through K-12 education, college, um, and through careers. And I'll also explain uh, what that pipeline means in a bit. Physicists, though, or other scientists, can take actions to minimize these barriers. We can. Um, to be inclusive, however, the first step, it's always the first step, acknowledge the problem, right? And this is a problem that keeps evolving. And so we have to not only acknowledge the problem, but acknowledge it as it evolves. Um, and at some point, we have to also acknowledge that it's not them, it's us. And by them, I mean you, and by us, I mean physicists. Because uh, we always focus on recruiting. All right. So what do I mean by needs? So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, it's a little bit archaic. I think most sociologists don't really use it anymore. But it was helping me when I was first um, learning about diversity kind of frame uh, why some people might have an easier time going into science than other people. And so. Basically, this just says your needs at the bottom have to be met before you can worry about the other needs as you go up. And so food, water, warmth, rest, right, basic needs. You have to be fed, sleep, be warm. Uh, once those needs are met, then you might uh, be concerned about security and safety. If you're living in a war zone or constantly looking over your shoulder, it's kind of hard to focus on anything else. So once those needs are met, we look into a sense of belongingness, friendships, joining a community. Uh, then you can move on up to esteem needs, feeling of accomplishment or prestige. And only after all those needs are met can you reach the top, which is achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. And so when I saw this, I was thinking, well, the top's physics. Right? You can do physics if you're tired. People do. You can do homework when you're tired, right? Are you going to do your best homework? No. You can do things when you're hungry, but you're not going to be at your best. And so if we kind of go through this in terms of why people may or may not go into STEM, right at the bottom, poverty affects academic achievement. That's been known for a long time. However, pover poverty disproportionately affects different races in our country. So almost 40% of black children in our country live in poverty. Almost a third of Hispanic children live in poverty compared to less than 20% of white or Asian children. 
What compounds this, not just living in poverty, but most schools are funded by local property taxes. So if you live in an impoverished area, you also have fewer resources at school. This is a societal problem. This is something that's way above my pay grade. I'm not gonna be able to fix it, uh, but it's something that I always keep in mind when I am working with children. So when I uh, start talking about my outreach uh, programs, you'll hear me say free a lot, and we feed them, because um, I do what I can even though I can't solve the problem. Uh, so going up, if we translate this into kind of the science world, safety uh, could be interpreted as being free from harassment and discrimination. I used to think that we were doing a really good job there, um, but the more you know, the more you know how much you don't know. Um, we're not doing a great job there. It is one of the reasons that a lot of women leave science still to this day. Uh, so thinking about a sense of belongingness, especially with uh, teenagers in high school and college, I realize this is one of the most important places where people either decide to stay in a field or leave a field. It's whether or not you feel welcome. Are there other people here like me? Would I fit in in this community? Could I see myself hanging out with these people all the time? Right? Um, also, kind of on the flip side is, what is your life like outside of work? Some people have no problem working 28 hours a day. And yes, there are not 28 hours in a day, but some people work like it is. They make good scientists. Some people don't. They want to have a life. They want to do other things. Uh, they want to spend a lot of time with their family and community. Some fields are more flexible about how your time is spent. Uh, physics can be time demanding. And so considering that and how we recruit people in. in terms of prestige or feeling of accomplishment, uh, this has a lot to do with both confidence and how you define success. So a lot of people define success differently. Uh, I will tell you that tenured professors define success as becoming a tenured professor, because that's what they did. It's obviously the right choice, right? And so some of them have a hard time grasping that you might want to get a PhD in physics and not become a tenured professor. And that turns some people off. Uh, confidence disproportionately affects men and women especially in fields that are male-dominated or fields the society says men should do better in. Um, has anybody heard of stereotype threat? A couple people. Has anybody heard of imposter syndrome? Same few people. What about implicit bias? Okay, I'll define all these things. Um, so, stereotype threat is when you're told by society that you're not supposed to be able to do something, and then right before you try to do that, you're reminded of it. So if I go onto the basketball court and try to slam dunk it, A, I can't jump. But they've actually done studies. When they remind white men that they're white before they try to dunk a basketball, they don't do as well because of the stereotype that you're not supposed to dunk, right? Um, women in math is the other very, very common thing. Does anybody besides, okay, a few of you might be old enough to remember, there was a Barbie doll that came out that said, math is hard. <laughs> Thanks, Barbie. Um, convinced an entire generation of girls that they shouldn't be into math. And so that's another thing, that when you give a math test to college students, if you remind the students of their gender beforehand, the women will perform worse. Not because they're bad at math, but because you remind them of a stereotype. Um, so that feeds into confidence. Okay, so the top is where you're actually succeeding. And I'll come back to a lot of those topics uh, in a little bit as we go through. So I kind of want to define some terms, especially in how I'm going to be using a few terms. So when we talk about diversity, um, diversity means a lot of things to a lot of different people. At its very, very base, it just means a group whose members are different with respect to some measure. That measure can be anything. You can have a group of white guys that are diverse in their favorite sport. You can have a group of people that are diverse in age. This room is pretty diverse in age-ish. We don't have anybody below 14 or 15, probably. Um, so diverse can mean anything, really. When we talk about it in regards to STEM, we're talking about very specific things. Inclusivity, uh, the way that I think about it, is that anyone who has the talent and desire to do something should have equal opportunity to do it. 
How many of you have seen the movie Ratatouille? Or the rat cooks, right? So one of the themes in that is that anyone can become a cook. And the one guy has a problem with it. He's like, not everybody can cook. We don't want to tell everybody they can cook because not everybody can cook. But the point of it is anybody coming from anywhere can become a cook. So that was one of the points of that movie. And that's what I mean here. Anybody who has the desire, who has the talent, should have equal opportunity to succeed in physics, engineering, math. So that's part of what I mean by inclusivity. Now when we talk about diversity in STEM or working groups or problem solving groups, what we really want is diversity of thought. So they've done studies in business and in engineering that if you take a very homogenous group of people, you take four guys that graduated from the same prep school, right? they had the same background, same prep school, you give that group a problem to solve. They will come up with a solution pretty quickly, they'll all be pretty happy with it, and it'll be a decent solution. Now you take four people from four very different high schools from across the country, give them the same problem, it will take them longer to come up with a solution, None of them are going to be very happy about it because they all had to compromise, but objectively, it will be a better solution. Because you have different ideas competing, you discuss more, you think about more, you innovate more. Business knows this, they want to make money, so they want diverse working teams. Um, science knows this, so they want diverse teams so that we can be more innovative and have more discoveries. But it's really hard to measure diversity of thought. And it's really hard to measure inclusivity. How can you tell if a college is being inclusive? It's hard to measure. You can feel it. You can know if it is or isn't. Uh, but scientists like measurements. They want numbers on pretty much everything. And those things are hard to assess. And so people with different life experiences, different backgrounds, um, different worldviews will approach the problems differently. And they'll have different uh, diversity of thought. In science, when we are recruiting for diversity, I think sometimes we forget that this is what we're really after. And we know that men and women often think differently, so maybe if we get more women, we can say that we have diversity of thought, or that people from different backgrounds often think differently, so if we can increase the racial diversity of our groups, that we should have diversity of thought. Because um, increasing the number of women, you can count. You can put onto graphs. I'll show you graphs later. It's very easy to assess. Um, but the things that we're actually after are harder to assess. You can't have diversity of thought if you don't have inclusion. So I don't know how many of you heard of uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, I don't even know how long ago, now, that was called Lean In. So I think she was a Facebook CEO, um, and she was telling women, if you want to succeed in the business world, you have to lean in and do as the guys do. And there's a lot of pushback on her book. Um, I think if you want to succeed in a man's world, that might not be bad advice to do whatever they're doing to succeed. However, if that world is really wanting diversity, that's the wrong way to get it, because you're not getting diversity of thought. You're just getting the same mind in a different gender's body. right? So you're not getting the benefits. Um, if you maintain a rigid selection process, you will not get diversity of thought. You're just selecting the same people that you can count differently. So of course, inclusion is hard. So you want to be open that, so that anybody can come and exceed. Uh, you want to have events where anybody can participate if they want to. But it's really, really hard because we are all so very different. And so I've been thinking about religion lately, not just because I work at the University of Notre Dame. Um, we cannot discriminate based on somebody's religion. We all know that. We can be friends with people who have different religions. We respect people who have different religions. This is fairly easy for us. Um, but if you want an event to be inclusive to everybody, regardless of their religion, it's really hard to even find a day when you can hold it. So I didn't know. There are a lot of things I didn't know I didn't know. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists don't work on Saturdays. Orthodox Jewish people don't attend events on Saturdays. Almost all public science outreach events are on Saturdays, right? Um, if you have an event that's at 2 o'clock, you will be excluding men who go to pray. When we, uh, when we travel for conferences in science, I don't know if you guys know this or not, we get paid to travel, or our travel is kind of covered whenever we go to conferences. Muslim women need a chaperone when they travel, but 
the funding to cover their travel doesn't cover the chaperone. And so we're not being inclusive. Lots of other random things. Dietary needs. I think as a society, we're getting better about this. Uh, most events that I go to now have at least a vegetarian option, sometimes dairy-free, uh, gluten-free. Ten years ago, if you were gluten-free, you brought your own salad everywhere. Um, so we're trying to be more inclusive in this sense. Physical disabilities. There are ADA laws about accessibility um, for any new building that's built. It doesn't always affect the buildings that are already built. Um, it doesn't always affect how we structure events or conferences. Um, I go to a lot of physics conferences where the speaker doesn't want to wear the microphone because they're like, oh, no, no, I don't need a microphone. I don't need a microphone. I can project to the back of the room. Well, that's great, but what about the hearing impaired guy in the back? Like, we don't always think about those things. Sexuality and gender identity. It is, in most states, legal to discriminate against somebody based on their sexuality or gender identity. And so it's still a problem in science sometimes. Until there are legal protections for different populations, it's really hard to tell a professor that they can't not work with a student. So there are professors who won't work with gay or trans students, and there's no legal way to force them to. Child care, elder care obligations. A lot of departments want to have events at 5 o'clock or on weekends, but if somebody has to go pick up their kid after school, you're excluding them from being able to participate in that. Um, these are things that I constantly keep learning about. Because if it doesn't affect you, you're not likely to think of it, right? Most of those things don't affect me. So I have to hear somebody else's story or read a study about it until I start thinking about it too. Cultural differences in communication. One of the things I'm going to be talking about is we start uh, towards diversity by recruiting. But then once you bring in a diverse group, we have not learned what to do next. So it's kind of this post-diverse world. What do you do next? Um, there's a saying in the US, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Anybody heard that? OK, it's not that old an idiom yet. So what does it mean? Right? If you're noisy, if you make noise, people pay attention to you and you get what you want. If you just keep asking for it, you'll eventually get it, right? It's kind of the idea. At least that was my idea when I was a kid. In China, they say the loudest duck gets shot. <laughs> the exact opposite, right? So if you've got a research group and you've got people from China and people from the US and people from other countries with communication styles that I don't even know about, and you keep wondering why your Chinese student never speaks up in meetings, you might just think that they're either shy or don't have anything to say unless you know that they're not going to speak unless they know that it's OK to speak, because they're told to, yeah, the lot of stuff gets shot. You don't want to make a scene. All right, I forgot to mention, at any point, if anybody has a question, whether it's clarification or just what about, just stop me and ask, OK? All right, so now I'm going to get to the, the part of the talk that I've actually been giving for six years. The other stuff is stuff that's been on my mind a lot lately. So recruiting efforts in physics. The idea has been, if we just show people how cool it is, everybody will want to do it. Makes sense, right? I mean, I love to do demos. I do magic or, magic or physics demo shows where I like, hold fire in my hand or uh, light a $100 bill on fire, things like that, smash bricks on top of people while they're laying on a bed of nails. If you just show them how cool it is, people will obviously want to do it. That's our thought. And the story that we've been telling ourselves for the last 30 years, 1994, um, is that when you go into a high school physics class, it's roughly 50-50 by gender. But somehow, when you go to college, there's less than 20% of your uh, college physics majors are female. And so the field has assumed for decades that the problem, therefore, is between high school and college. It makes sense if you're looking at the numbers. And so they've been doing a lot of recruiting. Um, and it, the numbers keep getting smaller and smaller as you go. And so this is our solution. We send physicists into a classroom to talk to them about physics. Most people recognize the show. How many of you thought of this when I said physics? Not that many? Okay. So in this episode, they send three male physicists into a junior high or a high school, I forget which, to talk to all the, the young ladies in the classroom about becoming scientists. And at some point, about halfway through the episode, they realize they're not the ones who should be talking to the students, right? And so then they all call their girlfriends, and that's, they're talking to their girlfriends on the phone because they're actually female scientists. 
Um, so we have a, you know, good ideas, we just don't always implement them well. Okay, so what does this pipeline I keep talking about? It's just kind of a path where you start in grade school and you end up wherever you're going to end up. So it's this career pipeline that we talk about. So this is just a generic shape of a funnel. Um, since I'm in nuclear physics and part of my job is to recruit people into nuclear physics, this is how I think about it. There's some number of students in grade school who are interested in STEM. By high school, that number is fewer that are interested in science. By college, the number majoring in physics is way smaller. This is not to scale. Um, those going to graduate school is actually about half of those that major in physics. Uh, and then those in graduate school who choose nuclear physics is about, I don't know, 15% of them. And so the idea is, if you can make any of these areas bigger, everything else below it should get bigger by the same amount. That's the idea. Again, we're scientists. We like simple models. Um, but the question I've been thinking about for a really long time is, is this funnel had the same, same shape for different demographics? We know that it doesn't for women, and that's what they refer to as the leaky pipeline. That at some stage, people think right in here, women fall out much more quick, quickly than men. And I think I forgot to mention, I'm gonna talk a lot about gender, not because it's the most important thing, but because it's the only group that we have enough statistics to say anything about. We do care about a lot of things, it's just those populations are too small, especially in physics, that we can't statistically say anything without uh, losing the uh, anonymity of the people that we're talking about. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some of our outreach programs because that's, that's been my job for the last nine years is to make this bigger. At any level that I can, make it bigger so that hopefully the, the bottom of the funnel there is bigger. So run a high school camp or camp for high school students. Uh, it's been going on a really long time, old, longer than some of you have been alive. Uh, over 25 years in Michigan State, over 10 years at Notre Dame. It is a free, free week-long residential uh, program. I refer to it as a nuclear astrophysics boot camp. These are kids who want to spend a week of their summer learning about nuclear physics. They're a special bunch. They're very nice. Um, the goal of the program is to give them a realistic science experience so that they can determine whether or not that's a career that they want to pursue. Um, so we don't sugarcoat it, we're not nice to them. They do research, they have lectures, they go at least to Notre Dame from 8.30 in the morning to about nine at night. It's a boot camp, right? And at the end of it, some of them are like, oh my God, I love this, I want to do this. And some of them are currently in grad school and that makes me really happy. And some of them are like, nope, don't want to do it. I'm like, well, at least you found out now instead of college or grad school or your first job. It's fine. Um, so I started uh, looking at this about 10 years ago. We get about 200 applications a year because it's free and residential. You just have to be able to get to one of the campuses, um, which is also a barrier. We accept 44 students. Um, but in 2011, the first time I started reading these applications, only a quarter of them were from young women. So these are high school students. And I'm like, what's going on? I thought there was a parity in high school. I thought there was supposed to be 50-50% high school interest and the problem was in college. Turns out I was one of the later people to find out that it's really, the problem's way earlier. And a lot of people know this, but the large societies are still targeting things uh, at the high school, college level. This number has gone up uh, just over a third a couple years ago, so that's promising. Um, I think it has to do with 20 years of, of running programs for, for people. It's me, which a lot of you guys are probably around 20 to 25 years old. So how many of you have pretty much grown up hearing about women in STEM programs? Some of you, right? How many of you were ever told why we have women in STEM programs? Oh, how many people were told why we have women in STEM programs? So you were, because you were around when I was, before kind of they started. But for a long time, we've been running them and not telling people why you're running. So that's one of the reasons I give this talk. Um, so we also look at the, the ethnic breakdown of our applicants. Um, and when I say underrepresented uh, minorities, it has to do with how many are in the field versus how many are in the US. So in the US is about 60% white. Our uh, applications from high school kids are 66% from white students. Um, Asian Americans are about 6% of the U.S., but a quarter of our applications for this program. Um, and so then by default, the black, Hispanic, and Native Americans are all underrepresented. Um, this is 
pretty accurate from the field of physics too, not just our high school program applications. So I was thinking about this, wondering, well, who's lying to who? Because obviously the problem is well before high school. So I started reading about things. Um, in fact, people have been looking at this for a while. Somebody did a longitudinal study on high school students to see what did they want to do when they came in, what did they want to do when they left, and what did they actually do. Um, and he basically found that the strongest indicator of what somebody wants to do when they graduate high school is what they want to do when they enter high school, at least in broad terms. You're either for or against STEM by the time you get to high school. Few, few percent of people switch one direction or the other, but for the most part, you've already decided by high school whether or not STEM is your thing. So I also do some programs with younger kids. Uh, Art to Science Camp is uh, organized chaos. I've got 150 kids for a week doing 24 hands-on creative art projects in 12 different rooms. Um, it's so much fun, we decided to do it two weeks, so now we have 150 kids followed by another 150 kids. The people that work in this building really love us. Um, sliding scale fee. So this is the one program I have to charge for because it's so big. Uh, it actually costs about $20,000 a week to run, so I gotta charge some of the parents something. Um, but I decided to tie the fee to the school lunch fees. Because as a kid who filled out a lot of financial aid applications, I've never understood why we ask poor people to do more work to do the same experience. I just don't understand it. So I just ask parents, what do you pay for school lunch? Or what would you pay if you, because some people homeschool or whatever, if you pay full school lunch, full fee. Free school lunch, free camp. Reduced school lunch, I think it's like a third of the cost for camp. Um, I also work with any parents to give them discounts if they have multiple kids or somebody says, hey, my husband got fired, but we don't technically meet the you know, reduced lunch or whatever. I don't want anybody to not be able to come to the camp because of their family finances. Uh, we also work really hard to make the camp accessible to a variety of disabilities, including uh, kids on the autism spectrum. So every year I've got a few kids on the autism spectrum. I just get another teen and have them be their buddy for the week. Um, when kids turn 13, they still want to come to camp so they can come back as junior counselors. They have to work for me to come back. Basically, they clean up after the little kids. Um, this camp has been going on for so long now that almost all of my adult Counselors used to be junior counselors. Some of them used to be campers. It's kind of scary giving them 12 kids to take care of for a week, but they do a great job. Um, so yeah, it's been going on about 10 years. So yeah, they do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, make noise with violin bows, which pop out little wave patterns. Uh, they draw with bacteria, learn about math by actually sewing curves on paper. Um, so I started looking at the kids that come to the camp because you know, I saw there's already a problem before high school. And I wanted to know, was my idea of the, the school lunch thing working? And I was kind of sad that still three quarters of the kids coming were paying full lunch fees. I mean, it's great, because I need money to run the camp. But I had kind of hoped that that fraction would, would get a little bit bigger. I didn't understand, is another thing I didn't know I didn't know, until I started talking to teachers and principals at different schools, and I learned that travel was a huge barrier. The camp runs nine to five, so parents that work nine to five can drop the kids off before work and pick them up after work, which is great for parents that work nine to five. For everybody else who may not have a car, may be on the bus, it was not great. Um, so we've actually teamed up with a couple of schools, and every once in a while I can send uh, one of my Notre Dame students in a Notre Dame vehicle to go around and pick some kids up from their neighborhoods to bring them in. But travel was a huge barrier. It wasn't just the cost of camp. I was also really shocked when I first started looking. The first year, it was way worse than that. First year that I did this camp, 60% of the kids were boys. These are 8 to 12 years old. Their parents are the ones choosing or signing them up for camp at this point. So the parents were sending their boys and not their daughters. It's flabbergasted. Um, it's gotten a little bit better. It's still always slightly more male, but it's at least like 51% now. Uh, part of the goals of this camp, there are a lot of goals, part of it is just to have a good science experience. I talk to so many adults that as soon as I say physics, they're like, ugh. That's literally the response I get sometimes. And honestly, if I'm on a plane and somebody asks me what I do, depending on whether or not I want to keep talking to them, I either say I educate people or I'm a physicist. It's a real conversation killer. So I want them to have a positive science experience so that when they're older, they're like, oh man, I remember doing science. It was so much fun. I um, want them to think about science as a process, not just a set of things that you can look up on Google. Because it really is a process of gaining new knowledge. 
and also that anybody can be a scientist. Um, and so I do pre and post surveys beforehand to see what kinds of effects they have. Um, I ask them what words they would use to describe science. And so I ask them, you know, is science hard? And the d numbers were all over the place. So here on the bottom, I have age, so little kids, older kids. And then in red, I have the, the male responses. And this was before the camp, because I thought, well, if I look at the pre-surveys, I can see what kids think just out in South Bend before they come to the camp, right? And I, when I started looking at a lot of these words, at eight and nine, things were pretty similar. But as you got to 12 years old, you start to see big differences in how the boys and girls view science. So another one I ask is, is play, is science play? Really kind of somewhere for the eight and nine year olds starts to deviate quite a bit at 12. And so that the guys think science is more play then. Like, okay, I'll just ask them if they like science. That's an easier question. So on a scale to 10, one to 10, how much do you like science? Oddly, they all love science. That one kind of shocked me too. I thought it'd be a little bit lower. But they haven't been to high school yet. I think that's when we beat it out of them. So yeah, 85, 90% of the kids love science. Okay, how do you feel about math? Not the same. So even at 10 and 11, it starts to split off that the females don't like math as much. I don't know if that is real or if it's society. Um, a lot of people, when they talk about diversity in STEM, they think that success is going to be when we have 50% men and 50% women in every field. And I don't know why we should have that goal. We know that there are differences between men and women. That's why we want co-ed groups, because they're better problem solvers together. I don't know what fraction it, could, it should be, because we'd have to take out all of the societal inputs that tell people what you should and shouldn't do before we could even figure that out. Um, so I don't know what that number should be. Not everybody's going to like math. But it shocked me that it started to get different as they got older. Uh, so one year, I really wanted to focus on scientists could be anybody, right? So in the pre-survey, I put a bunch of pictures on a piece of paper. Um, these were the four guys, and I said, circle the ones that look like scientists. This was in 2013. It was before the Cosmos reboot, so most people didn't know who Neil deGrasse Tyson was at the time. And so we've got Hubble, Stephen Hawking. This is a Notre Dame professor. And then some women, Notre Dame professors, some uh, older physicists. This is Lisa Randall, a contemporary string theorist who's been on like The Daily Show and stuff. I think she looks like Jodie Foster, so, you know. So what do you think the kids did? Anybody want to guess? So this was before the camp. Uh, here I've got the females in orange and the guys in yellow. So everybody, you know, Hubble's sitting in a telescope. Obviously, he's a scientist. That was my control as to whether or not they were doing it. Uh, Hawking, some people may have recognized. The Indian professor from Notre Dame, 60% of people thought he looked like a scientist. But all the women in Tyson, this line here is about 30%. It's only about 30 per 40% of the kids. Now, luckily, the, the girls did think that the women looked more like scientists than the guys did. I'm not sure that's great. Um, so that was a little bit disheartening at the beginning. So we did uh, this intervention activity where all the students learned about one scientist who had uh, faced some kind of barrier in becoming a scientist or engineer. Charles uh, Steinmetz was an engineer who was a dwarf. Rosalind Franklin discovered DNA and never got credit. Kent Cullors was a blind astronomer. Um, Emmy Noter actually had to teach under a guy's name because women weren't allowed to teach at that time. So all the kids learned to dance or skit about their scientist. Um, and we did this because there had been a study looking at all the different interventions and how to change how people view scientists. Um, they looked at single sex physics classes, having females come in and talk to the students. The one thing that they found made the hugest change in how high school students viewed who could be a scientist was directly discussing the reasons we didn't have women scientists. Directly discussing all the discrimination and everything else that had gone on was the one thing that had a large effect on them because they realized it wasn't lack of talent, it wasn't lack of desire, it was being barred from areas. So there was a, one of the telescopes, I forget which one, for the longest time, up until I think maybe in the 70s, no woman astronomer could go and use the telescope because they only had one restroom and it was a men's room. 
Never mind the fact that it was a single stall. There was only one restroom, and it was a men's room, so women couldn't run the telescope. So Vera Rubin applied for telescope time and just, I think, put V as an initial and got telescope time. And they were all very shocked when a woman showed up. And after that, they decided that the single stall could be a unisex bathroom. But those were the kinds of things that women faced, and that's why we don't have a whole lot of uh, role models for the younger generations. So I don't want to show you the, the post results, because sadly, they didn't change much. The guys kind of came up to the, where the girls were, but there wasn't much of a change on that. Um, I do keep looking at the words that they use to describe science, um, and most of the differences have washed out. So this was from last year. Pretty much 55% of people think that science is hard. That's fine. Science is hard sometimes. A um, little bit less, but at least it's even across the board with age and gender. About 30% think that science is play. I don't know how much of this is society. I don't know how much of it is the fact that these kids keep coming year after year. So most of the 12-year-olds, this is like their third or fourth year coming. I have no idea. I want to take credit, but I don't really know what's going on. Okay. So now I want to talk about retention, which I wanted to talk about longer. And looking at the time, I should have split up earlier. So retention after recruiting. It worked. Now what? There's that post-diversity phase, right? Um, I was at a conference two weekends ago, and they had me as a speaker at a conference for women in physics. Remember the, the Sheldon photo of them sending people off? Uh, so I was talking with a bunch of the women there, and there was one that was a, a first-year graduate student in engineering. She was actually kind of crashing the conference since it was for undergrad physicists, but that's fine. We didn't care. She flat out said to me, oh, I should mention, I was in Texas. And apparently, College Station, Texas, where I was at, is the whitest town in Texas. That's what I was told. So she had moved there for grad school, first year of grad school. And she said, I know I'm only here because they want brown people, but now what? My advisor doesn't know how to mentor me. I don't know how to find people to talk to. I can't find any clubs or any neighborhoods where I feel like I fit in. Now what? And so that's why this has been on my or it's part of why it's been on my mind a long time. Um, so now I'm going to talk about implicit bias, because that's very related to, to where we go in the post-diversity world. So people, and especially scientists, categorize things. It's actually an evolutionary trait. Uh, if you see a wild animal that's running at you scarily, you want to be able to classify all scary wild animals in one thing as, will eat me, run away, right? I can show you five different kinds of chairs, and you know that they're all chairs. Five different kinds of tables. So our brains are evolved to be able to categorize things. It leads to stereotypes, which generally come from somewhere. I mean, the Sheldon stereotype as a physicist exists for a reason. Um, most physicists have some Sheldon-esque traits. There is no one physicist, though, that is exactly like Sheldon. He is an exaggeration of the stereotype. Stereotypes in general are an exaggeration of the little things that we see. And so if you were to assume that all physicists are identical to Sheldon, that's when the stereotype becomes unfair, right? So we're going to do a little exercise. Hopefully you guys will humor me. I want everybody to close your eyes and think of somebody funny. Raise your hand if you pictured a man. Raise your hand if you pictured a woman. OK, keep your eyes closed. Now I want you to picture somebody caring. Raise your hand if you pictured a man. Raise your hand if you pictured a woman. Raise your hand if you pictured your mother. Yes, call your mother. All right, you can open your eyes. So almost anywhere I go, it's the same results. And it's the same results that you will find if you go to ratemyprofessors.com and look at student evaluations. You guys heard of this website? I see some people chuckling. Yeah. So there's this guy, Ben Schmidt, made an awesome little applet. You can go to this website and play with it for hours like I did. You can put in any word you want, almost, and it will search all the text and all the comments on ratemyprofessor.com, and it will plot them by uh, subject and gender. So funny and caring. Not surprisingly, every single field, the male professors are described as funny. Apparently, the comedy world has had its own sexist issues. Again, that cultural, I don't know what all plays into it. But as a society, we think men are funny, funnier. Caring. As a society, we think women are more caring. 
you can't change that. I mean, in the Western society, we are raised with the notions that we're raised with, but you have to acknowledge or know that when you walk into the classroom, those come with you, and you apply them to your professors. Um, oddly, physics ranks low on both of these. I'm not exactly sure why. That's fine. Um, I put it in emotional, and physics was at the bottom with, like, two votes, which is kind of funny. So I kept putting words in, testing out different ideas. Professor and teacher. This is rate my professors. It's all in college, right? Across the board, men are more often described as professors. Women are more often described as teachers, except for whatever that is, communication or criminal justice. So you guys are in college. Who would you rather be taught by, professor or teacher? Sometimes words matter in how we view things. Um, my guess on this one is that most of our K-12 teachers are women, and we call them teachers. And it's at least a lot of fields, a lot of the professors are men. Um, but this has very subtle impacts on people. Genius, brilliant, smart. Finally, physics rises to the top. Um, oddly not unwise, though. <coughs> Genius, brilliant, smart. Again, we use those words to describe men. In particular, we use those words to describe white and Asian men. It's a very strong racial component to that one as well. Uh, wise wasn't as broken apart, but it's still mostly men who more often described as wise. So does this matter? Student evaluations are used in determining whether or not professors get promoted, whether or not they get raises or get tenure, or whether or not they're hired at another university when they apply. And the evaluations are just mimicking what we see in society. Um, and in fact, you can test your own implicit bias to see if you associate men or women with science, or, or there's a whole slew of things. If you look up Harvard Implicit Bias Test, they have a group that just keeps making implicit bias tests that you can test yourself on. Um, I get sad sometimes when I see my own implicit biases, but again, it, recognizing the problem is the first step. So for me, one of the biggest problems, though, is implicit bias creates a feedback loop and can affect how students see themselves. So you have a young woman that wants to study physics. She's in the classroom. She finally has a female professor that she can look to as a role model. But in the back of her mind, unbeknownst to her, she's thinking less of her female professor and looking at her as a role model, which means that gets reinterpreted into her brain and makes her think less of herself. It just creates this feedback loop. Um, so I mentioned, or the last one I showed you was about brilliant, why, or brilliant, smart. Do you think it matters if we call people brilliant? I don't know, it could, depending on what you value, right? If you value brilliance, it's going to matter. So somebody did a study and asked a whole bunch of professors, so these were college, university professors, to succeed in your field, do you have to be brilliant or work hard? And so here on the x-axis, they found a way to quantify that. Basically, brilliance is over here, work hard is over here. They also did this for the humanities, but I'm showing the um, science one. And so math, physics, computer science, engineering, it's one of the big reasons I said that those you can just kind of interchange. We all have basically the same problems, little nuances. So I've not labeled the y-axis here. Anybody want to guess what it is? Percentage of women getting PhDs in the field. So we don't think of women as brilliant. We don't refer to them as brilliant. So if you're in a field that values brilliance, you're not going to think of that person as the best top tier quality person to hire, just because of our implicit bias that we grow up with. Um, this is also why biology is above 50%, or one of the reasons why biology is above 50% women. Um, astronomy is, has a higher percentage. Most physics departments and astronomy departments are actually combined. Um, so we throw out numbers like there's 25% you know, of women in physics, but really it's below 20. We're just including astronomy to make ourselves feel better. Uh, but yeah, chemistry is up here. And so this notion of brilliance has a huge impact. Um, the speed through this stuff, because I talked too long. So we did a, a couple of longitudinal studies on our PAM program. And so we wanted to know, is it working? Right? Are they going into science? We found that they were eight times more likely to major in STEM, and we asked them why. It was that sense of community. It was, I really feel like I fit in at the lab. I knew that I could fit in into a science community. It really was about a sense of belonging, is why they chose to, to stay in science. 
Um, we also used to give the students pre and post knowledge tests to see if their, their content uh, was changing. The most interesting thing we saw out of that was that the boys and girls always scored the same, pre and post. Not, I mean, pre they all scored about the same, post they all scored about the same but higher. But we'd ask them about their confidence. And every single time, the guys were totally confident and the girls were totally underconfident. They got the same grade. And in fact, on a physics exam, averages are often low. Sometimes an average on a physics exam might be 70%. So if you're used to getting all A's, that can be a little bit disheartening. If you ask a male student who got a 70% or got the average afterwards how they feel, they're like, oh, I got the average, I'm good to go. If you ask a female, she'll think she failed. And this feeds into uh, imposter syndrome a lot. So what I'm saying here is statistical. It's not black or white. It's not 100%. It's all statistical likelihood, OK? There are always lots of exceptions to all these things. Um, but imposter syndrome is when you feel like, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. Sooner or later, somebody's going to figure out that I'm not supposed to be here. And then what am I going to do? This happens to a lot of people. It happens more often to people who are underrepresented in whatever field that they're in. Um, but it happens to a lot of people, and it lasts for a really long time. I know some tenured professors who still have imposter syndrome, who are still waiting to be found out, even though they have tenure. Um, so it's something I always like to tell students, it's OK to feel, and it's OK not to feel it. And so, actually, before I go into that, I'll tell you one little other short story. So these are some of the kids that I uh, had, I don't know, seven years ago now. Some of them are majoring in physics. Uh, at least one of them told me that she was very excited. She was doing, she was an undergrad majoring in physics. She was doing summer research at a nuclear lab where I happen to know a lot of people. It was great, right? Then she tells me the story about them going out for lunch. So a lot of times research groups will go out for lunch together. They had a visiting speaker, so it's time to kind of get to know the speaker and, and talk to them. And so while they're talking, the visiting speaker, who was an older professor, says to her, you shouldn't go to grad school. Every female scientist or every female physicist I know is just miserable. I would never let my daughter go to grad school in physics. Now, on one hand, there are people like that. You're not going to change them. Um, on the other hand, if you have an attitude like that, it's not surprising women are miserable around you. Um, but what really bothered me was that her research advisor was sitting there and didn't say anything. Nobody else at the table said anything. She had to stand up for herself and say, you don't know me. I'm going to do what I want. She has. But nobody else stood up for her. This is why I keep talking about retention. Um, so I want to know if our application materials that we we're getting for the program uh, were biased. I'd read some papers uh, from the medical and biochemistry fields that showed that there was a strong gender bias in the language used to describe uh, male and female candidates in the sciences. And so some of the things they saw were talking about research versus teaching. So men, they talk about research. Women, they tend to talk about teaching. Um, I'll tell you, when people are applying to teach at a research-intensive university, they honestly don't care about the teaching that much. They care much more about the research. Um, grindstone versus ability words. This is where the brilliance comes in. So grindstone is keeping your nose to the grindstone, trying hard, dedicated, motivated. Ability is brilliant, talented, genius, right? So obviously, those words show up more for men, and those words show up more for women. So we wanted to see if this was prevalent in our high school materials. We didn't really care, because we actually accept by parity, so we only rate the girls against the girls and the boys against the boys. But these are the same letters of recommendation that are submitted for scholarships, for college admission, for other summer programs where they may not accept based on parity, because most don't. Um, we asked them on a scale of 1 to 5, tell us how good the student is. They're all excellent students. Um, Girls are in blue. They oddly eke out the boys almost every single category. None of these are statistically significant except for works well in groups and works well independently, in which case the girls do better in both. Um, but somehow, when the teacher looks at the overall quality of the student, they're identical. It's like, the girl's better at this, the girl's better at this, the girl's better at this. Oh, but they're equal in the end. And this is kind of the general story that we see. Um, I have a general recommendation request for anybody that ever writes a recommendation letter. I'm going to skip over some of the stuff. Which is basically, after you write it, switch the pronoun and reread it. I'll show you why. He brightens the room with a smile and a pleasant word. These are real things that were written about people who want to do physics for a week. 
Surprisingly enough, his personality far outweighs his academic ability. You'd absolutely love him in no time. Very nice young lad. His heartwarming smile and endearing personality. I think he's a friendly boy, but I really don't know due to his very reserved personality. I will get, tell you a secret. In physics, we don't really care about somebody's personality, at least not historically. It's a nice bonus. You need to be able to work together, but that's not what we're looking for, right? We're looking for the talent, for the brilliance. Um, this one still makes me angry. In my 16 years of teaching at this school, he is one of about four male students who have shown great promise as a leader in science. This woman has taught I don't know how many students and didn't see her female students as potential leaders in science. Okay, so we looked at the words. In fact, grindstone words were statistically significant uh, in our letters of recommendation. The other things were actually evened out. I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff. Just show you some really depressing data to end it off. All right, they did another study. They emailed uh, professors. They sent a whole bunch of professors fake emails saying, hey, I'm interested in your graduate program and your research. I'm going to be on campus Monday. Can I meet with you to talk about your research? And they changed the name on the email. And they looked at the response rate. Right? And so here, uh, the bigger the gray circle, um, the more likely they were to respond to a white male sounding name. And the larger the black circle, the less likely they were to respond to a white male sounding name. Um, so the only subject that didn't want white men was fine arts. I can't imagine why, unless you've seen a straight of dance. Um, but then Chinese females in every single field were less likely to get a return email. Uh, the sciences, for whatever, well, I know why, uh, black females and Hispanic females were the only two groups more likely to get a response than the white male. So assume that you've jumped through all those hoops. You made it through the implicit bias, the imposter syndrome. You convince somebody to work with you, and you go out to get a job. So uh, they asked 127 science faculty at different uh, universities to rate some application materials for somebody that they were considering hiring for a lab manager. So this is like a bachelor level position, something you do right out of college. All they changed was a name, John and Jennifer. John was more competent, more hireable, deserving of more mentoring, and of course deserving of a higher starting salary. All they changed was the name. Now that we have online courses, they've done a lot of these studies because you don't see the professor. So they just changed the name and look at the student evaluations. Huge difference. Okay, so there are a lot of things that we could do uh, to better to retain diverse faculty, a lot of things at department level, college level, society level. Um, so that's kind of summarizing a lot of the surveys. Overcommitment. Women are more likely to volunteer for outreach, for service. They're more likely to mentor, and yet they still have to keep up not just the same research publication record and get the same amount of grants. They have to publish more to be seen as equal. They have to have a higher citation rate to be seen as equal to the men. And men actually cite themselves more, so they always have a slightly higher uh, rate. OK. So we're trying efforts towards inclusion. We have recruiting programs, but we don't train our faculty as mentors. So they don't know what to do when we actually recruit people in. We have professional development for young women, but we don't educate our populace on bias as physicists. We create best practices and reports and we send them out to departments, but there's no incentive to implement them. Um, junior scientists are really, really great at inclusion. So when they organize a conference, they think about uh, the diversity of their speakers, they think about dietary needs, they think about bathrooms, they think about pronoun stickers for name tags, they can think about everything they can. They're not in charge yet. I keep telling them, wait 20 years, you guys will have it, we'll be fine. Worst off though, we don't know what we don't know. And if you think about that long enough, you might go crazy or you need to talk to a philosopher. So we don't know what we don't know. And as physicists, the biggest problem is we think we know everything. We think we're very objective. Um, so why does physics lack diversity? We don't acknowledge the problems. We won't give up the system that chose us because obviously it was a good selection system if it chose us. Uh, underlying both of those, we tend to not believe studies from soft sciences which is why I talk to physicists, because I know that implicitly they'll listen to me better than a psychologist, even though a psychologist knows it a little bit better. We value research over personality um, or toxicity. We promote those who conform to the existing system. So any 
uh, institutional change is very slow. Um, and I also think that we refuse to accept that the problem is us. Problems within the field. And on that lovely, happy, uplifting note, thank you for attending. <laughs>